And this is the uh, 29th talk in this collection, and it's entitled The Path in Harmony. And this was originally published in uh, the book A Taste of Freedom. Uh, and uh, it's a composite of two talks given in England in 1979 and 1977, respectively. And I believe this was also translated by Puriso, Bruce Evans. The Path in Harmony. Today I would like to ask you all, are you sure yet? Are you certain in your meditation practice? I ask because these days there are many people teaching meditation, both monks and lay people, and I'm afraid that you may be subject to wavering and doubt. If we understand clearly, we'll be able to make the mind peaceful and firm. You should understand the Eightfold Path as morality, concentration and wisdom. The path comes together as simply this. Our practice is to make this path arise within us. When sitting in meditation, we're told to close our eyes, not to look at anything else, because now we're going to look directly at the mind. When we close our eyes, our attention comes inwards. We establish our attention on the breath, center our feelings there, put our mindfulness there. When the factors of the path are in harmony, we'll be able to see the breath, the feelings, the mind, and mental objects for what they are. Here we will see the focus point, where samadhi and the other factors of the path converge in harmony. When we're sitting in meditation, following the breath, think to yourself that now you are sitting alone. There's no one sitting around you. There is nothing at all. Develop this feeling that you're sitting alone until the mind lets go of all externals, concentrating solely on the breath. If you're thinking, this person is sitting over here, that person is sitting over there, there's no peace. The mind doesn't come inwards. Just cast all that aside until you feel that there's no one sitting around you, until there's nothing at all, until you have no wavering or interest in your surroundings. Let the breath go naturally. Don't force it to be short or long or whatever. Just sit and watch it going in and out. When the mind lets go of all external impressions, the sounds of cars and such will not disturb you. Nothing but the sights or sounds will disturb you because the mind doesn't receive them. Your attention will come together on the breath. If the mind is confused and won't concentrate on the breath, take a full deep breath, as deep as you can, and then let it all out until there's none left. Do this three times and then re-establish your attention. The mind will become calm. It's natural for it to be calm for a while and then restlessness and confusion may arise again. When this happens, concentrate. Breathe deeply again, and then re-establish your attention on the breath. Just keep going like this. When this has happened many times, you will become adept at it. The mind will let go of all external manifestations. External impressions will not reach the mind. Sati will be firmly established. As the mind becomes more refined, so does the breath. Feelings will become finer and finer. The body and mind will be light. Our attention is solely on the inner. We see the in-breaths and the out-breaths clearly. We see all impressions clearly. Here we will see the coming together of morality, concentration and wisdom. This is called the path in harmony. When there is this harmony, our mind will be free of confusion. It will come together as one. This is called samadhi. After watching the breath for a long time, it may become very refined. The awareness of the breath will gradually cease, leaving only bare awareness. The breath may become so refined, it disappears. Perhaps we're just sitting, as if there's no breathing at all. Actually, there is breathing, but it seems as if there's none. This is because the mind has reached its most refined state. There is just bare awareness. It's gone beyond the breath. The knowledge that the breath has disappeared becomes established. Then, what will we take as our object of meditation now? We take just this knowledge as our object, that is, the awareness that there's no breath. Unexpected things may happen at this time. Some people experience them, some don't. If they do arise, we should be firm and have strong mindfulness. Some people see that the breath has disappeared and get a fright. They're afraid they may die. Here we should know the situation just as it is. We simply notice that there's no breath and take that as our <coughs> object of awareness. This, we can say, is the firmest surest type of samadhi. 
there is only one firm, unmoving state of mind. Perhaps the body will become so light as, as if there is no body at all. We feel like we are sitting in empty space, completely empty. Although this may seem very unusual, you should understand that there is nothing to worry about. Firmly establish your mind like this. When the mind is firmly unified, having no sense impressions to disturb it, one can remain in that state for any length of time. There will be no painful feelings to disturb us. When samadhi has reached this level, we can leave it when we choose. But if we come out of this samadhi, we do so comfortably, not because we've become bored or tired with it. We come out because we've had enough for now. We feel at ease. We've no problems at all. If we can develop this type of samadhi, then if we sit, say, 30 minutes or an hour, the mind will be cool and calm for many days. When the mind is cool and calm like this, it is clean. Whatever we experience, the mind will take up and investigate. This is a fruit of samadhi. Morality has one function, concentration has another function, and wisdom another. These factors are like a cycle. We can see them all within the peaceful mind. When the mind is calm, it has collectedness and restraint because of wisdom and the energy of concentration. As it becomes more collected, it becomes more refined, which in turn gives morality the strength to increase in purity. As our morality becomes purer, this will help in the development of concentration. When concentration is firmly established, it helps in the arising of wisdom. Morality, concentration and wisdom help each other. They are interrelated like this. In the end, the path becomes one and functions at all times. We should look after the strength which arises from the path because it is the strength which leads to insight and wisdom. On the dangers of samadhi. Samadhi is capable of bringing much harm or much benefit to the meditator. You can't say it brings only one or the other. For one who has no wisdom, it's harmful. But for one who has wisdom, it can bring real benefit. It can lead to insight. That which can possibly be harmful to the meditator is absorption samadhi, or jhana. The samadhi with deep, sustained calm. This samadhi brings great peace. When there's peace, there's happiness. When there's happiness, attachment and clinging to that happiness arise. The meditator doesn't want to contemplate anything else. He just wants to indulge in that pleasant feeling. When we've been practicing for a long time, we may become adept at entering this samadhi very quickly. As soon as we start to note our meditation object, the mind enters calm, and we don't want to come out to investigate anything. We just get stuck on that happiness. This is a danger to one who is practicing meditation. We must use upachara samadhi, that is, neighborhood or access concentration, before jhana. Here we enter calm, and then, when the mind is sufficiently calm, we come out and look at outer activity. Outer activity here refers to all manner of sense impressions. It's used in contrast to inner activity of, of absorption samadhi, where the mind does not go out to external sense impressions. Looking at the outside with a calm mind gives rise to wisdom. This is hard to understand because it's almost like ordinary thinking and imagining. When thinking is there, we may think the mind isn't peaceful, but actually that thinking is taking place within the calm. There is contemplation, but it doesn't disturb the calm. We may bring thinking up in order to contemplate it. Here we take up thinking to investigate it. It's not that we are aimlessly thinking or guessing away. It's something that arises from a peaceful mind. This is called awareness within calm and calm within awareness. If it's simply ordinary thinking and imagining, the mind won't be peaceful. It'll be disturbed. But I'm not talking about ordinary thinking. This is a feeling that arises from the peaceful mind. It's called contemplation. Wisdom is born right here. So there can be right samadhi and wrong samadhi. Wrong samadhi is where the mind enters calm and there's no awareness at all. One could sit for two hours or even all day, but the mind doesn't know where it's been or what's happened. doesn't know anything. There is calm, but that's all. It's like a well-sharpened knife, which we don't bother to put to any use. This is a deluded type of calm, because there's not much self-awareness. The meditator may think he's reached the ultimate already, but he doesn't bother to look for anything else. Samadhi can be an enemy at this level. Wisdom cannot arise, because there's no awareness of right and wrong. With right samadhi, no matter what level of calm is reached, there is awareness. There is full mindfulness and clear comprehension. 
This is the samadhi which can give rise to wisdom. One can, one cannot get lost in it. <coughs> Practitioners should understand this well. You can't do without this awareness. It must be present from beginning to end. This kind of samadhi has no danger. You may wonder, where does the benefit arise? How does the wisdom arise from samadhi? When right samadhi has been developed, wisdom has the chance to arise at all times. When the eye sees form, the ear hears sound, the nose smells odours, the tongue experiences taste, the body experiences touch, or the mind experiences mental impressions in all postures, the mind stays with full knowledge of the true nature of those sense impressions. It doesn't follow them. When the mind has wisdom, it doesn't pick and choose. In any posture, we're fully aware of the birth of happiness and unhappiness. We let go of both of these things. We don't claim. This is called right practice, which is present in all postures. These words, all postures, do not refer only to bodily postures. They refer to the mind, which has mindfulness and clear comprehension of the truth at all times. When samadhi has been rightly developed, wisdom arises like this. This is called insight, knowledge of the truth. There are two kinds of peace, the coarse and the refined. The peace which comes from samadhi is the coarse type. When the mind is peaceful, there is happiness. The mind then takes this happiness to be peace. But happiness and unhappiness are becoming and birth. There is no escape from samsara here because we still cling to them. So, happiness is not peace. Peace is not happiness. The other type of peace is that which comes from wisdom. Here we don't confuse peace with happiness. We know the mind which contemplates and knows happiness and unhappiness as peace. The peace which arises from wisdom is not happiness, but is that which sees the truth of both happiness and unhappiness. Clinging to those states does not arise. The mind rises above <coughs> them. This is the true goal of all Buddhist practice. Here you are.